first drifted alarmingly in the bedding was, you know, fancy in the morning it continued to drift. It was laid on the on the exchanges to, to lose. It was something you'd see in a, in a Dick Francis novel, Charles Bones. The ground is soft, it's not, it's oh, not. it's heavy. Soft on time, so it's, it's, it's heavy. Okay. Hello and a big warm welcome. It is Sunday sermon time, that time of week where we whinge for about an hour and have some funnies at the end and talk about random chocolate bars, etc, etc. Though we're not talking chocolate bars this week, no. Joining me to chew the fat to start the show, it's John Ling and Chris Lorne Malvo. Hi, Sheriff Lorne Malvo. That's me, yes, yeah. yes. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. How's everyone's weeks been? Shit, really. Yeah, man, man. <laughs> Time was every fucking week. Man's been up there with the weight my dad dropped dead, to be honest. So. <laughs> yeah. oh, God almighty, John. I, I know. We're going to start as we mean to go on. Miserable. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to start the show as usual with the review of this weekend's action, or if there was anything eye-catching, uh, I'll come to John. First of all, but John, first of all, Frankie last night and Sanatar Anna. Yeah, six, six from six. Santa and Eater, of course. But yeah, six from six. And then he was going to be seven from seven if he won on the five in the Kentucky Derby, but was outridden by Antonio Frezzo. Do you remember him? I do. Yeah, I was fancied him to outride Frankie in a big race, you know? Yeah. I thought it might happen sooner or later. Yeah. After time in there, Chris Bell. Good old Rezu. I like back to what we said on, said on a previous show regarding jockeys that are of a, how shall we say, without being too rude. Journeyman. Uh, yeah, journeyman. Average to decent, but that's all. And it shows you Adam Biscuits had it at Fairgrounds. Ben Curtis is making hay out there now. Antonio Frezu's just won the Santa and Eats of Derby Grade 1. It's a call out to jockeys here. Look at the state of the game here. Think about your careers elsewhere because a lot of these American riders aren't all that, which is proven if you're Adam Beskitzer and you're on 6% over here. He was top jockey at fairgrounds for a while. So there you go. Any jockeys are listening, think about it. If you were thinking about it, do it. Go thrive over there or Australia or wherever. I think the Australians are better though, from what I can gather than the American jockeys as a rule of thumb. Whatever you do, take our advice and go. And then yeah. when, you, when you've made it and you're doing well, send for us. Yeah, send us yeah. a few quid. Send more money, <laughs> system going well. Yeah. Anyway, apart from Frankie's success last night. How many of them was the Bob Buffett, by the way? I'm not sure. He, he, there was one or two. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the juice is flowing over there. Yeah. It was funny because I watched an interview of Frankie. He said to the interviewer, Oh, it's just wonderful to ride for the Hall of Fame of Bob Buffett. Get <laughs> fucked, man. <laughs> Fucking two wankers together, aren't they, really? A perfect yeah. match. <laughs> right. So I just, I just cringed at that. Yeah. I thought, yeah, he's been done. For, God yeah. knows how many times for yeah. drug offences over there. The Hall of Famer. Yeah. I wouldn't describe Bob as that. I went into space, you know, and crash landed after going through a time loop. I wouldn't land on Planet of the Apes. I'd land on Planet of the Wankers and there'd be Bob Baffert and Frank <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. Bob Baffert sponsored by Boots the Chemist, didn't he? Must uh, be fucking hell. John, can I ask you a question? I saw a, a thread today. And would Frankie Dettori get in your top 10 jockeys of all time? <laughs> no. It was a really good thread, actually. I wish I'd have picked it out and we could have discussed. Obviously, there were a lot of American jockeys on there because it was done by an American. But mm. to be fair to the American, he did put in... Steve Cawthon, an American. <laughs> <laughs> Would Ryan Moore make your all-time top ten? No. No, it's probably a ridiculous statement, really. In fact, this is a ridiculous statement, that. So would Pat Edry be in your all-time top ten? Yeah. 11 times uh, champion jockey, John. That's an interesting stat, isn't it? 11 times British champion jockey. That's a man that worked like a... It was a, it was a machine, wasn't he, Pat? I mean, it's, it's... Yeah. And kept going with a bad back as well. Yeah. So, would, who would you say were better? Pat, well, obviously, Pat at his peak mm. is better than Dottori. Yeah, 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 that's really Pat, Lester, Carson, mm. Wally. Yeah. Um, what about Jeff Baxter in a fight? Yeah, fucking Jeff, Jeff Baxter. Baxter. <laughs> what about <laughs> Boots Madden? Would he be in there? Boots Madden have been the top 10, wouldn't he? <laughs> Nail boot slippers. <laughs> 
<laughs> Flod Munro Wilson, he's got to be there, hasn't he? Yeah. Jimmy yeah. Wright up there with brothers. Yeah. <laughs> Alan Munro, he, he could knock him out yeah, at all, couldn't he? Fight, can they? Yeah. yeah. He, he was absolutely zen. He, he, I mean, he did, served his time with Mel, Alan Munro. Incredible. And then there's up riding uh, generous and yeah. incredible story, Alan Munro. Dylan, Coventry. Yeah. yeah. So, lots of good stuff for Alan Munro. Dylan and fat... Jim Sack as well. When he got raised. In the Fard Salmon. Days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The dark green. Do you know they're iconic colours? Yeah, they cracking are, colours they are, aren't they? All dark green, yeah, yeah, like them. We move on to the review, and this is where we look at Saturday's action, John. Anything at Kempton or Chelmsford that floats your eye going forwards for the season? Yeah, Kempton, I thought the uh, the Till Marva, where it was quite front-endy, really, wasn't it? I thought Sleeping Lion ran a blinder. Yeah. Um, he maybe had a, a good trip to the fact that he was on the inner all the way around. But uh, he really caught me out of the way he travelled. And I think I think to actually make progress and get into the second was a right, right good effort. I mean, if he only went up a couple for that, I, th- I think he'd be very competitive somewhere in the very near future, you know? Yeah. Do you think it were a fair enough trial for Novel Ledin for Chester Cup, maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, again, midfield sit, you know. I mean, he wasn't winning halfway down the back, was he? So, no. yeah, that was all right. And chances are he'd go on the likely ground at Chester. So, you, you could go there with a degree of confidence, I would have thought. Yeah. What did you think to the snowdrop? I was seething after choice here that, that I thought she should have won, really. It was weird. I think the effort of getting from where she was to the front just told in the last 100 yards. Otherwise, I think she'd have won. It's a frustrating kind of bet, really. I suppose somebody's got to sit wide. You can't always have your best position. But yeah, it, it was just one of them things, wasn't it? And then she, she was left with that bit of ground to make up. She made it up quick enough as well. And then, as I said, I think she, just had an out left in the last 50 yards, really. Emptied out yeah. a bit. I think I think she might be in, in for a decent season. I think she's definitely on the improve. Like, it was progressive yeah. last year. Yeah, I think she'll come on for that myself. Um, yeah. As well, you know. Um, I don't think she's a mark there. Yeah. No. Anything else catch your eye, Saturday? Not especially. Um, the Godolphin, too, so maybe... Um, devoted Queen, I thought was very green still, and I would hope that they go somewhere like that mile handicap at Ascot rather than clashing towards the Guineas or anything like that. And similar thing for notable speech, although I think that's probably not got a lot to learn now. I mean, he's pretty instant acceleration when asked and things like that, but I'd tend to think more. Uh, Heron stakes type then with a real towards Ascot. It'd be interesting what path they take because I, I do think Godolphin are quite strong handed in the Phillies department. So in regards to Devoted Queen, I would I would with her definitely take my time with her because mm. I, it's as almost as if she needs another run in a normal kind of winnable race, doesn't it? In the conditions race, the dandy mate in the right suit. Possibly, I'm Thanks. not sure. Yeah. That's what you do when it go. If you were them, you'd go quiet race next time, mm. or, or relatively quiet. Even if it's a listed contest, that probably do, but just quietish. You hope that uh, Mick Appleby doesn't go Guinness. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So there we go. So Devoted Queen is one to watch out for because I think there's a lot of improvement from her today at Leopardstown. What was obviously I already know what sort of what you think. Are the bad conditions you did not partake with any cash. Today, you you didn't bother with the racing at all. But I know you watched it. So what was your take on things today? Tough conditions. I thought it found some of them out. I thought the Phillies conditions race was pretty good where a, a lilac roller beat Kitty Rose because I, d- I did not Kitty Rose prey race. I thought she had done exceptionally well over the winter. Yeah. And she, she was coming back at that winter, I thought, at the, at the finish. And I did notice that the first two took an edge to pull up, whereas most of the winners before that were, <laughs> you know, they were struggling, struggling to get past the, the cutaway where they the bring them back out, you know. Uh, they, these were away down the back on the, on the pull-ups, so they really got each other at it. 
I think it was slowly run though. At the time, yeah. twelve twelve point three nine slow. It was like one and a half slower than Battle Cry in the Colts, which suggested they probably didn't go gallop. And if you back buttons, I won't give up on that because I thought Ryan, I think tried to do a, another Battle Cry. I think he, he mm. wrote Battle Cry and thought, well, that's the place to be because he just seemed to just want to go back and back with her and he gave her a lot to do she came from next to last into third late and i thought she would possibly be better a lot better than that on another day but i know you like kitty rose paddock wise don't you well very much so i, I wasn't over in emma last year but I, I thought she'd done exceptionally well over the winter yeah and shanti in the uh, 10 furlong handicap blowing away a mark of 85 will she go d stakes next john you would think yeah you'd think Chester or Lingfield, wouldn't you? In fact, what an idiot. D Stake is a cult. <laughs> Again, it's another one of them names. I always think you'd call a Philly Shanty. You know, when we've had this discussion yeah. about when you see a name and you think, well, that's a Philly. Got to be a Philly. Yeah. And it's not. I've just done the same thing. It's a cult. So that'll obviously be the. Um... It could be the D. D Stakes is a cult. It, it's D Cults. What, what's the Phillies one now? Cheshire Oaks. Oh, okay, no. I'm losing it. I'm losing the plot. Oh, the day states in the vase, yeah. aren't you? At Chester. Yeah. How many brain cells do you lose a year? Ugh, Eleven. <laughs> I think I've just lost my chest at one. Eleven or more. <laughs> <laughs> I have. This is the thing. We have moments. Even we've been around for years with the same meeting, and I used to have brain farts. Ormond, D, Cheshire Oaks. So yeah, it'd be the D states, wouldn't you think, for Sean T. And I think that was it today. That's all all we've got for the weekend. Not not really one to drag the show on. Right. right. Where do we start? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's going to say you just, you lot just fucking moan all the time. Game's gone. <clears throat> blah, 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 blah. Chris, where do we start this week? Where do you want me to start? Do you want me to start on the horse PWR, BHA website? What yeah, why on? not? Yeah, let, let, okay. let's yeah, do that. The BHA have introduced a new initiative in terms of trying to educate pork regards to the welfare of how British horse racing works, producing statistics on fatalities, the reason uh, the whips doesn't harm them, etc. There's lots of things on there that explains to the probably... Does it explain why a whip that doesn't harm them is limited? I think it does do. Right, so the whip. So let's look at the whip here. It says... It doesn't tell you how many, but it says new. Strict regulation around the whip was introduced in 2023, ensuring that the use of the padded pro-cush whip for safety and encouragement is tightly controlled with thresholds for use set at very low levels. Mm. Since these rules were introduced, they have been breached on only 0.75% of rides or significantly less than one in every 100 rides. Obviously, it's full of statistics, on racing someone's already pulled them up on wrong ones and uh, that was that in 2023 the bha claim that 158 horses in both flat and jump racing experienced fatal injuries while running on the track when someone says well i've got data to prove that there's 193 in that period not a great start and this chap as well he replied to us on twitter and said that bha had ignored him every time that he was just trying to help them, saying, look, here you are, here's the list. He got no reply, nothing. He didn't tell them he was a listener, did he? <laughs> did he does he have a double-barrelled name? Because I think if he did, they would have listened, wouldn't they? You need a double-barrelled name. A... Tied Fertner uh, or something. That's, that, that's what well, you... Let's be fair, if you haven't got a double-barrelled name, who the fuck's going to listen to you anyway? Exactly. Yeah. Precisely. It's true. It's true. It's true, it works. Good a deed, Pollen. Let's all get double barreled names. Yeah. <laughs> I fancy oh. you called uh, Colonel Pontifax Carr double barreled, Matt. I think it's quite nice. <laughs> so it's not a great start in the fact that you get your stats wrong because obviously, we, us as a podcast, we always pick up the likes of Gambling with Lives and the Gambling Harm groups for doing this in mm. terms of using statistics for policy, if you like, that, 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 that maybe sway government policy or may not sway government policy because that might be a closed shot, to be honest. Money sways government policy, isn't it? Money to the MPs. 
It is. It's usually some donation. Yeah, <laughs> donation of some sort. Is there a fee? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Tom Marley. He'd right. be MP channel, wouldn't he? Is there a fee? Of course, yeah. Derek. Yes. Yeah. I'd like to give your two opinion on this. Mm. So, Os PWR, is it a good idea? First of all. Well, I mean, they brought this out as a preemptive strike, expecting an onslaught from Animal Rising this week, haven't they? Mm. And now Animal Rising have just announced where well, we can't be asked. You reckon it yourselves? Yeah, <laughs> well, it's, yeah. It's, it's true, and it's it is you know on on I suppose from a common sense reading, yes, it's a good idea, but but it's a defensive record, isn't it? No, nobody's mind is ever changed by statistics or doing research because that's not how people these days form opinions you know that they'd be better off bunging some youtube influencer a couple of hundred grand and telling them to go online and tell everyone that racing's a fantastic sport that's wonderful and safe and you'd get more bang for your buck than i think spending you know months compiling statistics because nobody can well, stats, do that if you're talking about page adra out in the current bun and yep. said if you go racing five times a year, yep. you're guaranteed to get three shags out of it. Yes, precisely. Put on the gate. Yeah, and a punch in the face as well on the on your well, on, on your fourth visit or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Because so, so yeah, that, we, that, that's we, not we, how people work these days, do they? You, you know that, Lee. I mean, you know, you might seem counterintuitive, but nobody sits and thinks before I form an opinion, I'm going to do loads of research. You know, people form opinions from gut instincts that, and what that they hear. That comes back to what we discussed last week with the uh, the diversity blocks. And before you select a trainer, yeah. you'll be looking at what his views are on sustainability <laughs> and the environment. Yes, and nobody you know, does that. Nobody does that. Bollocks. Yeah. Rubbish! It's total nonsense, and they know that as well. They're not that stupid, but it's a it's no, a piece. Of, it's a defensive record, isn't it? You know, so they can wheel this out and say, "Well, actually, look mm. at the work we've done. These are the stats." But it's not going to change anybody's mind. People like that are a proper sort of like against horse racing. Yep. As in, it's not going to change their mind. But yep. I, the golf club bore came on mm. and replied. What did he say? I I, I I did miss. I, well, I did see it, but I wasn't sure what yeah. point he was making. Uh, um, Fair play to Richard, Richard Oyles. He, he came on and said that it wasn't designed to go to war with Animal Rising. No. It was designed to just have the information yeah. there. Maybe after the Nationals say, it might be worthwhile reply, if you ever reply to maybe a, someone that's not a rabid that says mm. horse racing should be banned, but someone that says, oh, yeah, I, I, I kind of like watching horse racing, but it, it goes through me a bit this time. Mm. The other. Maybe just give them the link to the website, yeah. which is obviously horsepwr.co.uk. And, and I think that's probably a good thing to do because then you don't have to spend four or five hours having a debate with them, Yeah, which is what I used to do. I tried to yeah. help the cause by saying, look, there are aspects that maybe need looking at, but in general, the, these are tre- like absolute royalty. Mm. And yeah, that kind of works. So I personally applaud the BHA for doing this I do on the whole think it's a positive and a good initiative, but I think we're pissing in the wind in terms of uh, trying to appease anyone or say the young TikTokers that somebody actually, th- there was a stable last that, uh, that follows us. For, I think she works for Prescott. Yeah. Oh, right. get a bit of info there. Find out her name. The bullfight, the bullfighting oh, yeah. Prescott. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She actually made a good point and she said the BHA really should have maybe a young person active on TikTok. You, you, you'd think so. You, you, you'd wonder why. Why not? I mean, it, it, it To try and engage yeah. To, yeah. about a- animal welfare yeah. where the youngsters are, to mm. stop the youngsters being brainwashed by the likes of Animal Rising. That's surely a, a really good option for the BHA to consider. I don't know if they have. I don't want TikTok. I don't use it. But no. certainly a BHA TikTok account that he's showing people about animal welfare and maybe publicising the horse PWR on there to the youngsters who actually do watch TikTok. So, yeah, so that's where I'd maybe go. But as a rule of thumb, as John's always said for years on this show, once you start seeding ground to the anti-crowd and, again, the number of strikes, et cetera, et cetera, with the, with the pro kush. I think you're on a hiding to nothing. I mean, Adrian Dan makes a sort of a valid point, really, mm. when he said, Julie Arrington's welfare campaign is well-meaning, mm. but what would it look like after, say, three horses break their legs in the National? Yeah. Then the PWR site, you might as well take it down. 
<laughs> just that, that's it, isn't it? I'm yeah, right. Cause, cause, yeah, it's an emotional response. People make decisions using their emotions. But, you know, look, look how that would skew the stats, wouldn't it? If you get oh, yeah. The, the, it, it's, yeah, it, whatever they do, they can't win on this one, can they? And what I found interesting, and I didn't know this, it shows you how much they've dumbed down the fences. Because in the National, John, you, you won't believe this either, right? There's not a horse that's fallen or unseated at beaches since 2018. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Right? And the Topham since 2016. Like, last five years, not one horse has fell or unseated at, at Beaches Brook. The most notorious fence. It's, it's not so much a fence now, is it? I mean, no. we can maybe, maybe step over it. You can see that as well in correlation what the BHA have been doing. Obviously, it's not publicly, but tracks have dumbed down our fences significantly because the stats of fallers in the UK have dramatically fell over the last five years in all races. Like, hmm. they've made the fences a lot softer, which, to be honest, it's not a bad thing, that, John, is it? No, I don't think so. I mean, I'm no fan of jump racing, so you're probably asking the wrong person, really, but... I mean, it wouldn't bother me if they were all hurdles, in all fairness. But it, but it's fact, isn't it? I mean, the stiffer the fences, the more fallers you're going to get and the more potential well, yeah. fatalities you're going to get. I always said that the real worry at Liverpool was that fucking Mildmare cars because they were stiff, them fences. Well, that's it. You've got a sharp track with heavy birch. You couldn't get through them. If you, if you hit them, yeah, you, you ended up tipping up. I, I maintain that when one man fell at the Mildmare cars and got killed... I'd say three out of four cars is he, he, he'd have got away with that. No, so, so so maybe not a bad thing. Again, if if we're trying to get longevity into the National Hunt game, which I think is definitely going to be the one that's definitely... Well, well why, I mean, at the end of the day, why do they have to fall, you know? I mean, the fences can be made out of fluff, in all fairness, you know? And yeah. I mean, the horse is still going to jump, take off and jump. The horse doesn't know what it's made of. It's because the horse do not them respect them. When you get national hunt horses, I've seen it many a time. I've seen brilliant chases that when when they run over hurdles, they just walk through them because it's like, what's yeah. this? They don't even just walk through that. I, and that's the danger that you could, if you met them out of fluff, <laughs> right? Yeah, right? Yeah. Maybe an extreme example. You Candy know, fluff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I mean, a hurdle can still deck a horse, can it? You know, I mean, that's that's golden signet. Yeah. I know what you're saying, but. Do you remember that Mr. Soft advert? Oh, yeah. yeah, the Mr. Soft. I remember that. <laughs> what was it advertising? Uh, mints or something? Mints, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mints, yeah. Imperial mints, I think. Yeah, the chewy ones, yeah. Soft, yeah. soft mints, That's obviously. Horrible yeah. things they are. Who would hate mints? <laughs> Vile. It was, it was like chewing gum that had, uh, what's it, toothpaste that had set a bit. Yeah, oh, it? fucking vile. Delicious. But, but this is it. So, so this is from the PWR website, the BHA's creation. They say 3,653 races, jump racing has a 0.42% rolling fatal injury rate. Flat racing from 6,366 races has a 0.08% mm. fatality rate. Yeah, I thought it was 0.07 myself. but <laughs> <laughs> Rounding error. Well done for the initiative. Yeah. The timing, obviously, before the national animal rising clearly don't need to do anything now. No. The BHA anyway uh, <laughs> ran the sport into the ground yes. with their silence mm. on affordability checks. They, they welcomed the white paper. Yes. Remember, remember the optics. That's what they said. Welcome. That you think is waving. They welcome. They welcome the gross profits tax day, didn't they? Yeah. And that's where all this nonsense stems from. This is where the rot set in with the ruling body hand in hand with the very people looking to fleece the very followers of the sport. Yeah. Yes. And that's it. You set up your funding models, that obviously loses pay for the game. Then, chaps, right? Yeah. How can you fund the game if people are taking out of it and winning? Well, that's it, you see. That's why the BHA sitting on their hands a bit because they realise that this will help the bookies weed the winners out. Mm. Why would the BHA want anyone making money? But again, mm. this is why horse racing is dead because... Because it you... should be a big selling point. You can make money. Mm. Yeah, you can actually do okay. How can you sell a, a gambling sport where you just can't win? You're banned if you win. And who's going to come into it? 
As no soon problem. as West Ham Racing said, come racing, you can win a bundle. Yeah, yeah. just not, not possible. It's, it's not possible now. No. Disgraceful antics, the big court bunks, they've destroyed the game. And of course, they seem to have bought a Bugatti this week in terms of <laughs> affordability checks to put the pedal down even further and the death knell in the sport by introducing open banking Good to God. the sport. Yeah. It, it's great stuff. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, myself, I, don't, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but Andrew Woodman, the same. When we found out this news, yeah. we were depressed. We were like, this is just, wow, open banking. And what they're trying to do is normalise open banking. Yeah. They'll try and normalise it in in normal society, saying, well, what, what have you got to hide? Yeah. There's no problem. It's for your benefit. No, mm-hmm. it's not for your benefit. No, it's- so I need to explain to punters... If you don't know what open banking is, I need to tell you because open banking is where they will ask you to give them permission to rifle through every single bank account you've got. And that'll include five years worth of transactions. If you click a link like they ask you to in order to continue betting with the said operator or to withdraw your funds, which they'll probably use if you've got an amount you want to withdraw. If you do this, they will get access to all your bank accounts. Simple as. That'll be all your transactions when you go to the delivery room, when you spent 40 quid at OnlyFans. <laughs> 40 quid? Who are you getting it from? I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. But you get it, right? So they'll see every single transaction. And this will result in them coming up with a sort of restriction level for starters. If they don't like you as a punter very much, they will use it against you to come up with a a shitty figure, basically, that you're allowed to bet with. Um, but it's not the betting you need to look at. It's the fact what they're going to do. They're going to make a fortune from your data. All your data is available for them to sell for third parties. There's no checkbox for, I don't want my data to go to third parties, which has to be a first, guys, for GDPR. Like, for example, you sign up to some somewhere, and there's, there's checkboxes, isn't there? Tick here if you don't want your data to be sold to third mm. parties, right? There's none of that. There's no tick box. It goes all over the place. They will sell it right, left, and center. Yeah. Then down the line, you become the risk of identity cloning. Yeah. Nigeria might get this, and it's like they've got your bank account number. They'll they'll have everything. Not just that, the profiling itself is worth millions to them because. They can profile punters then that have got a few quid and have got savings. Might have got, I don't know, say you got half a million in savings. They know then they can rinse that customer yep. for half a million and not break social responsibility rules. What's wrong with taking every penny off someone? If someone wants to bet, well, they're not in debt. We know this punter's got half a million. So they have marketing teams targeting this person right, left and centre. He likes a bet. He likes to go on the slots. We'll give you a thousand pound bonus if you deposit four, yeah. like they used to do. And they're just going to back to their old ways. And this is shocking stuff. This is absolutely mind blowingly bad. The BHA could at least speak out on this and say this is absolutely abhorrent. And um, unfortunately, we cannot back a, back such an initiative. No. But yet they're not saying anything. Every single media person. They've got bookmaker sponsorships, just about. I was even golf club bore Richard Hoyle. Sorry for picking on you, Richard, this episode. You write blogs for Betway. There's a list as long as your arm who people write for yes. that are bookmakers or, or, work, or ambassadors. The media have to help here because there won't be a sport. That's the thing. It's going to destroy the game. No idiot worth their right mind is going to do this. No. The only people that will are addicts because they want to bet. Yeah, it's a sense of that, that, that you know, people in the game are can see the writing on the wall and they're happy to heap the game's their own funeral pyre. Because ultimately, when, when the game does reduce to the extent that we have, you know, we, we kind of predict, most of these people will be out of work anyway. So it's now kind of ball of Rome. Let, let's make hay while the sun shines. Yeah, it, it, because it, it, there, there won't there won't be jobs for as many pundits, journalists, reporters, you know, because there won't be there won't be a need for them because the sport will be slimmed down. But look at what's going to happen. Let's say it happens to me, and Tain take on Bet Budget like Bet Three Six Five have, and I believe Bet Victor have. They'll all follow because they don't want to miss out on the valuable data. Then what? 
But if that happens, the exchange will fall because obviously I'm not going to provide it. So I, I'm done. My liquidity's gone. Yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. So, so we're all done. We're all finished. And then I don't subscribe to Timeform. I don't subscribe to Racing TV. I don't subscribe to the Racing Post. No. I don't need at the races. So I might, I might even fuck Sky Sports off. Yeah. Everything has a knock on effect. Yes. I don't go racing. And all of a sudden, racing has got a massive crisis. And that's because people, apart from us and a few others, Jeff Banks, fair enough, as, as from a bookmaking perspective, has at least spoke on this for a long time. Mm. But no one has spoke up. The sports regulator can't be asked to speak up. So then why should we be asked, John? This is it, isn't it? You know what I mean? If you're waiting for the regulator to speak up, you'll, you'll wait a long time because the gross profits day means the boat makers are basically leading the VHA around by the dick. Yeah. yeah which is, um, which is, we, we touched on it, didn't we? I mean, I, I'm not sure whether it's complete kind of cowardice on their part or, or, or they just simply don't understand the potential that this threat poses, you know, the potential threat. Maybe, maybe they just don't get it. I don't, I don't, but I don't the Nokies the Nokies will have sold it to them as a good yeah. idea. Along yeah. similar lines to how they sold the gross profits to. And then they'll say, look, this is good as well, because we can weed the winners out. And then all the other reasons Lee's just explained about targeting people with plenty in the bank and mm. yeah, you know, it's just despicable. But there yeah. it is. Yeah. Right, even the harm groups have been sold a pup. Right, so the harm groups have said, right, want something doing. This is disgraceful what you've done to rinsing people, and that's their argument and case. Yeah. And even some of those don't realise that they aren't going to weed out the people that are doing 100,000 a year on it's slot like more rinsing, won't it? Yeah, yeah, it will lead to more rinsing. And they need to speak out to help the cause. I think we all need to speak out the media. And it's a, this is a call out to the, to the racing media. If you want racing to survive, you have to do this and you have to do it now and you have to just go all in and all be united in the course. Because yes. if you're not, you can have your bookmaker sponsorships and a couple of grand that MGM give you or Paddy Power, whoever, whoever yes. sponsors you. But trust me, if you want to watch a sport in four or five years' time, if you don't, then fair enough. Milk the game yourself yes. on your way out and then do a Tomo, is there a fee? And there are plenty of them in the game. That's the problem. Barney Curley said it, you're all takeout merchants. But I guess I guess we all are to a degree. Oh, oh yeah, uh, you, you can understand it. And who, who's to say that somebody shouldn't take the, you know, a grand a month or whatever for writing blogs? You know, their circumstances may dictate that they need that. But you know, it, it, it's re- it is really difficult because racing has never been very good at uniting behind any particular one issue, have they? Punters included. You know, punters by their nature operate up from a from a sort of position of self-interest everybody does but uh, you know this is one rare occasion when somehow people have got to come together and just sort of say no you know what whatever means i don't you know a a boycott for one day of punting or whatever you know just to to let big corp and the bha know that the game relies on punters having a bet or being able to have a bet i'd be behind this if everyone would get behind a a one day boycott of betting particularly on say grand national day even who wants to be on national fuck the national to be honest like just do it everyone just do it get behind it the only thing i've i've got a problem with this is will they listen because they haven't listened to hundred thousand signatures saying no to affordability checks in racing the gambling commission haven't published consultations two of them twelve thousand respondees first one and i think more than that on the second one and they haven't published the results of what it's people all, it's are saying. It's all window dressing, as we've said, that these reviews and consultation exercises and petitions, that they are there to give legitimacy post the fact that, well, we have listened, we have followed the process, we have considered opposing views, but this is the decision we've made. Whereas we know that that decision was made before any of this happened. It's already been decided what's going to happen. Yeah. And just to finish on Bet Budget, the disgraceful blogger has done yep. like sort of work for them in promoting them this is how thick the lad is I thought he's done well for himself I'm, I'm saying that's what i mean he's done well for himself he's not done well for racing no. he's worked for bet ball he's done other things yep. he's all in it for himself mm. the thing is here he had the goal to post a video that chelmsford race course asked for id on entry mm. which mm. i agree is abhorrent i mean what yeah, do you yeah. need fucking id to yeah, get into yeah, a race prices, course yeah like? What a fucking strange thing that is. So he's saying on his video, I don't like this. It's invasive. 
It's intrusive. Yeah. It's he's asking questions. Why do I need to provide <laughs> this? Now. And yet the idiot has done two promotional pieces for, for Bet Budget. Because because it affects him personally. It's the same with the Racing Post mob. They only ever started to squeal when it affected them personally. When the likes of Birchie and Millington and Steve Palmer were writing weekly columns about how they had a grand each way on some filthy each way shot. No problem. But as soon as it starts to impact them in terms of restrictions and, re and requirements to provide personal information, it's like, well, this is terrible. People only ever operate out of self-interest. That's human nature. You know, it, because the, the bet budget thing did, doesn't affect blog when he's getting paid from it, you know, why should he give a shit? Agreed. And Ari Skelton, a special message for you. Signed up as bet budget ambassador. <laughs> Can you believe this shit? Right. So a yeah. prominent jockey that gets his wages paid for by racing, <clears throat> in, in effect. Yeah. He's signing punters death knell. Yeah. By being an ambassador for fucking bet budget. Harry Skelton, give your head a, head a wobble, you yeah. fucking thick. Yeah, it's a quiz, it. they're it. quizlings. They're like, you can imagine yeah. sort of Marshall Petan's Vichy regime, all these friendly old Nazis coming in. Come on, we'll join them. They seem like nice fellas. You know, it's, it's mad. I mean, that's a slight, bit of hyperbole on my part. But, you know, people don't see, all they see is the pound note. That's it. I'm going to give you some money. All right, great. What do you want me to say? Yeah, it's unbelievable. The thing is, as well, another, another thing to add here, Right, is the fact that the data that they collect on people when they ask for affordability checks, bookmakers will have a record of like the type of punter they are. Are they predominantly a slot punter or are they predominantly a horse racing punter? Give me a price, Chris, if this data could be released from big books that who they're asking affordability on. Are they asking more horse racing punters or slot punters? I don't know. I mean, I, I you know what? If you'd asked me this a couple of months ago, I'd have given you a reasoned opinion. I'm so confused now by what's happened. I, I, I wouldn't have a clue because I, whatever answer I give, I, I couldn't be sure that it's in any way right. I just don't know what's in their minds. Has to me. be horse racing. Has to yeah, be. Has to be. It, it has to be. But, you know, I, I just I find the whole subject at the minute, and I'm sure I'm not alone, just so confusing. All I can see is one grand plan just to reduce the extent to which people can have a bet and spend their money. And I, and I think we've said it before, haven't we? You know, you know gambling is, is the hot topic at the minute, but tomorrow it'll be something else. It'll be holidays, it'll be football season tickets, it'll be, you know, domestic travel, all that kind of stuff. This, this is a, an exercise in social engineering. And whether the people who are operating, you know, the, these plans themselves realise the grand plan, I rather doubt it, but it's going in one direction. Could be a test bed for societal inclusion in terms of open banking. Social credit and all that. Oh, you're a yeah. gambler. Oh, you know, your social credit score isn't as good as the person that, you know, that opposes gambling. So we're going to afford you, you know, better services, better rights, better access to, to, to services based on your social credit score. Coincidental, by the way, Bet365 were the first to implement this. Sporting Index have also in introduced something called Yoohoo, <laughs> some, some <laughs> kind of thing, where they, that's another bet budget company. But Bet365 lost £23.5 last year yep. in the UK. Is that coincidental then that Bet365 <laughs> now are fighting back? <laughs> of course it is. Mm. Not. <laughs> it, there you go. It, 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 look, I mean, anybody, you don't have to be particularly clever. God knows we're not. But surely this is obvious to, to, to those in charge who are obviously much clever and better educated people that what's going on here. So so I think, I think John's right. I think people have just been bamboozled and just, you know, gone along with whatever Big Corp have told them. Don't know what, what incentive they've been given or whether they've said, oh, it'll be all right in the end. But the fact that nobody's really fighting back in the media and, and, and you know, from the regulator is quite worrying, isn't it? You think it'd yeah. be uproar. You think there'd be strikes. There'd be National Day of no racing, no betting. But it just sort of, there's, there's a sense that somehow, I mean, it reminds me of the Homer Simpson quote, you know, when, when they asked what his strategy was for whatever. He said, I was just going to go to the back of the room hide under these pile of coats and hope that somehow everything worked out. And that seems to be the strategy that, that racing is employing at the minute. Just let's just hope and pray it happens. It works out to the, for the best. I want to know your opinion. Like the best racing media writers of all time or pundits or broadcasters. John, I'm coming to you. Who you miss maybe this day or maybe still enjoyed this day? Really, this will be quite controversial, I'm sure. My, my favourite writer... Um... Also, a good friend of mine, Paul Haig, mm -hmm. who used to write in the post. Yeah. I used to enjoy his stuff immensely. Um, 
a broadcaster of some repute, Julian Wilson. <laughs> yes, he was a brilliant broadcaster. Did you think so? He was a spot on racing presenter, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. He is one that a lot of people won't remember or have heard of. Ken Butler, who yes. used to uh, <laughs> do the away meetings on the ITV7 and the paddock on midweight racing. John Rickman. He was, he was really the bloke that got me into the game. Because uh, yeah. when I was scaring off school in the mid-70s, it, it was usually him that was talking to me while I was uh, sat on the end of my great aunt's bed watching the racing in black and white. Um, <laughs> next one would be Lydia. Best at, around at interviews, doesn't show mm. any deference to the people and ask the questions that we want asking in the main. Superb work with Ruby Walsh doing analysis of the jumpers for the Fez. And the last one I'll raise a few eyebrows, I'm sure. Adelmo Renan. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Works really hard, I think. Doesn't patronise viewers. Explains stuff with a view to novice viewers, but doesn't talk down. And I think she takes her work very, very seriously and is improving yeah. in spades. Fair enough. Love, lovely. Yeah, lo- lovely comments. I like it. We've been positive. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you see a bit of positivity on the show. Mm-hmm. I know. John, I like some of that. Some of that. Before I come to you, Chris, to finish, mm-hmm. I've, I've only got a couple, really. I, I used to really enjoy Sir Clement Freud's writing in the mm-hmm. in the sporting life. Oh, mm-hmm. not, not so much his interest in having sex with underage girls. No. Like that. That's the thing. <laughs> you, I mean, I like I'm, Gary Glitter's music, but I'd never admit that. Yeah. I know. I'm, well, exactly. Come on. You, yeah, come on, I, come on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I separate the two. Yeah. Quite nice, as you must, as you absolutely must. Yeah. But he's writing on racing, sort of diaries when he used to go. It was just phenomenal uh, reading in the, in the sporting life. He did a fantastic um, tip for a burger as well. said, put a bit of great yogurt in it. That's absolutely Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. Some of his articles in the past were just tremendous. And the other one, he was my favourite on Channel 4 of all time, which was John Frankham, because he just grabbed hold of a story or an article. He didn't give two fucks because he's worth more than Mick Easterby. So he just didn't care. He just went on a tirade. And that is something that he's missing now because they're all tied to books and bookmakers. Yeah. If John Frankham didn't like something, he'd just fucking say it. Like, yeah. absolutely as brash as anything and that for me was great tv that's why i watched channel four in those days because well mainly because of him I, th- I thought it was brilliant obviously you got the buffoon in mccreary yeah which... yeah J- john oak see you didn't know what day it is bless him did he you know everything was entire it's entirely possible whatever mm. whatever that you know his analysis of horse was will it win well it's entirely possible but there was chemistry there wasn't there you know, individually you, you can pick pick holes in them, but together they're actually a much more sort of compelling team at, at their peak, weren't they? Than they it, are. Now. It worked. It mm. all worked. Yeah. They, they all, they're all in a way they're all mates, and yeah. I think that's why it works. Chris, what do you think? Well, I, I think, you know what? I mean, I, I think I, I don't think I can deviate much from what you said. I thought, you know, J- Julian Wilson. I, I did think he was wooden as fuck, but I didn't think that was, you know, a, a downside particularly. He was that kind of patrician type you know, racing man that you kind of expected. And of course, you know, he was plying his trade when I first started getting into the sport. So, you know, there's a sort of a a bit of nostalgia there. In terms of writers, I think for me, Kevin Pullen, right? Because he never had a fucking bet. And if he did, it was like a quarter of a point win. If I'd have followed him, I'd be a lot richer than I am now, I think. So Kevin Pullen from the Racing Post football uh, columnist. Mm, yeah, Kevin Pullen. You remember yeah. him? He caught a point win, it was, or no bet. That was it. Was a standing joke actually on Twitter that you know he he probably advised only about three bets a year, and it's like a quarter of a point win. You know, over six corners, Stoke versus whatever. And you know he he was notorious for never putting up a bet. And I think if we'd have followed his advice, we'd all have plenty of money because he never played. He never played. He stakes so small. <laughs> like you know, you have to play five hundred pound a point. Yeah, we was like four hundred point. Most people is no bet. No, he'd write two thousand words on you know the, the expected you know the expected number of corners or free kicks or fouls, and then the conclusion was, of course, it looks fucking hard. Let's leave it. <laughs> Back next week. Nick Davis has been in. He says, "Are you three going to get a van?" And do a road show wow. from Northern Courses. I'll we'll be living in a fucking van at this rate. Well, I say it depends what type of van, doesn't yeah. it? There's Cara, there's yeah. ice cream, <laughs> there's Morrison. 
I'd want the fuckers one. I'd like, I'd want the big, you know, the big what I mean? bastard one. Yeah, yeah big yeah, chairs. Yeah. yeah, ice cream yeah. maker in it. All of that. Yeah. I, I think yeah. if I got one, got me hands on one of them, I think I'd just fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I want one of those kind of Western that. style one, like Tammy I'm Winnett. Glad, one. Dad just fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> just drive around the country. <laughs> we might end up having to get inside a business venture after all this affordability nonsense. We might have to have an ice cream van or a burger van. Yeah. John, if we had to do catering as a business, what would we do? Yeah, you'd eat all the fucking stock, you fat fuckers. There'd be nothing left for the punters, <laughs> would there? We've run out. <laughs> We, we, we'd, give it, we'd probably give it away to the mobile oyster service or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. John and his oyster. Yes. Yeah. We've, it, it, We'd it, lost the weight, I think. There'd be a profit word it won on that one. <laughs> yeah. It's been John down oysters and Jesus. <laughs> it goes down well. That's all I'll say. Chris Poole. Yes. <laughs> the yeah. trumpet yeah. man of Bet Victor, the rock on Gibraltar, says, racing his shit, game's gone. Yes. yes. Uh, that's more or less this show, That's really. It. You've oh. summed it up. A diverse question. Can I ask Ooh. the panel to help settle an argument? He's, he's, he's got with a pal <laughs> for 30 years. Uh, <laughs> was or should Mr. Ben be classed as a cartoon or an animation? This is, an, this is eye bath. He wants us to rule on this, does he, for this a bit? This is it. This is the ruling, Chris, and you need to get your mate to listen for the outcome. So, Chris, what are we saying? It, it is a cartoon, and I'll tell you for why. The question is misleading because it's it asks you to consider either or you know it, it, is it a piece of animation or a cartoon but that's like saying you know is a bmw a car or a mode of personal transport well the answer is they're both a- animation is just the the umbrella term isn't it so it's a cartoon because it relies on sort of you know stop go animation using pictures and from memory, and I can't quote it, and I'm trying to desperately look it up here, but the, the creator of Mr. Ben always regarded it as a cartoon. Now, that may be uncomfortable for Chris, depending on what side of the bet he's on, because, you know, you have an idea of what a cartoon looks like. You know, you think SpongeBob, don't you, or, or Hanna-Barbera. But Mr. Ben has all the attributes of a cartoon, so therefore it's a cartoon. Unlike, say, Wallace and Gromit, which is animation, but using, you know, models and figurines, using the same techniques. But that's a piece of, you know, is piece of animation, pure animation. But Mr. Ben, because it's a drawing, is cartoon. So cartoon is the rule, my ruling anyway. No, you're wrong. It's animation. Uh, so this is going to go No, you're wrong. Anyway. <laughs> dissenting, dissenting voice is gone. No, Anna Barbera was Air Bear Bunch and things like yeah. that. And, and that was cartoon. Mr. Ben was animated. It's the snowman walking in the air. That was yeah, what, what's, the di- what's the difference then in terms of the composite parts of, let's say, I don't know, the snowman and Mr. Ben? What, how does it know. differ? How does, how does it differ? I don't know. Cartoons, Bugs Bunny and Elmer yeah, but, Fudd. But, but, but yeah, yeah, but yeah, no, they are different. And that's why it's an uncomfortable ruling. But they share the same attributes, you know, pictures, some narration, a bit of music. It's a cartoon. Right. So we're one all job, right? <laughs> I'm animation. Chris is cartoon. You get the deciding vote for Iber. Well, I'm animation, but not for the reasons yeah. you said. Yeah, you're talking bollocks. You know, fuck all, any of yeah, you. Yeah, fuck off. Fuck them. Don't pay Chris. Don't pay them. I come from the school that says a cartoon is a drawing a la something what Gerald Scarf would do in the paper. That is a cartoon. The animation yeah. brings it to life. And that is what that is, because that's moving pictures. So it's an animation. Yes. And no, no, no. That, yes. That's not what, what Mr. Dictionary Mr. Says. Ben that's was lacking was when he should, he should have emerged <laughs> from the changing room one way in a vest and a pair <laughs> like of skin Robbie Dunn, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> carrying a knife and saying, this week I'm going to be a rapist. <laughs> oh, fuck me. <laughs> that, that, that would have lived the shopkeeper up a bit. <laughs> 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 The, the, shop, the, the shopkeeper could have been a paedophile, couldn't he, for all we know? He was that oh, sneaky, yeah. sneaky hooker from um, that Happy Gilmore fellas film. Uh, what was it? Mr. Deeds. You remember yeah, the Mr. sneaky <laughs> button? <laughs> yeah. <It's> sneaky, sneaky, <laughs> sneaky. You're, already, you're being exactly. racist because he's wearing a yeah. fez. They say, that's your problem. <laughs> Fucking racist. Because he wore yeah, a fez. Right. He didn't wear a fez. He had the old shoplift. The shopkeeper yeah. and the shoplifter even. You're both wrong. It's a cartoon. So, Chris Paul, 
It's an official Barstow's verdict. Wrong. It's an animation. <laughs> Two one. It's for rubbish. Chris it's a cartoon. Thank you for your question. No, yeah, not yeah. <laughs> Chris is absolutely wrong on Live this. It. I'm going to appeal next week. <laughs> <laughs> Send it to appeal by the BHA. You'll get her in three months, but yeah. it cost you four grand. Yeah, to, to we're going to get a appeal. barrister on that's going to argue fluently. <laughs> I'm right, and he'll send you a big fucking bill as well for like 100 grand for his time. Yeah. <laughs> Worst car discussion. Ooh, right, this is a good, good interesting. One. We've had mentions from listeners saying Fiat Pandas. Oh, yeah, horrors. Stephen Thomas has been on. He said that a Volvo 340 was a burn <laughs> shaker. So I'd like to know, like, your worst car experiences all three of you, John. I think possibly uh, the the first car I had actually was pretty bad. That was a, a Mark One Ford Escort, right? Uh, circa nineteen seventy two, cool. And uh, I, uh, I I had a bad experience at York, um, turning up trying to get in the Stables entrance on the on the advice of a friend. He said, uh, "Oh, they're only casual the security on there." He said, "Just blow your arm, they'll open the gate." <laughs> I drove up there and blow the horn. The security fella comes out of his little hut, and I can see him eyeing the car, you know. And I said, Come on, hurry up. I said, I've got to ask him the first. And he said, uh, Can I ask you a question? I said, Yeah, go on. He said, When was your last winner? And he's looking at this car. <laughs> so, so I said, 1972. I said, And I bought this car that was brand new. Very <laughs> <laughs> good. Very good. That is very good, John. Two experiences in my lifetime. The Fiat Panda one's funny that someone sent in because going back to memories, we were like, if you think it like TV show in between us, my mate got bought a Fiat Panda for his 18th. What we used to do deliberately, if you rocked about in it like enough, like from side to side, yeah. when you're at traffic lights, you'd stall it. <laughs> <laughs> so it used to frustrate the life out of him. He's like, Obviously, he's getting pipped at and flashed. And yeah. beat, we'd stall it every traffic light we yeah. got to. Bastards. <laughs> That's the Fiat Panda story. But apart from that, mine was a Ford Cortina. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was really bad. I bought it from a car up. Like, it's my first car or whatever. I went to a car. I thought, it looks all right. It's shiny. It's fucking all right. Yeah, Cortina, yeah. 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 yeah that was... For starters, you need to go to the gym to steer it. <laughs> yeah, no power steering, though. <laughs> Just blow the no... tyres up to like 9,000 PSI. I can remember getting out when I got it home. And, like, my forearms were like... Popeye. <laughs> You know, da, 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 da. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and the worst part about it was it blew smoke out of the exhaust yeah, really blue, bad. Blue smoke, I hope, because that's the best um, kind of smoke out of the back. No, it was white. Oh, that's all right, that white. It's blue yeah, smoke, yeah. don't worry about. Well, like James Bond, when you've got a villain behind the you, oil. <laughs> and you put the foot down. <laughs> Oil pissing oil out the back as well and, bl- and plumes of smoke. Brilliant. So yeah, it was fun, Chris. Well, I, I had I had an orange marina, right, which was old when I got it, and it had a sort of ripped uh, black vinyl roof, right, and you needed a butter knife to access the driver's door lock. That's how bad it was. But it's only a certain kind of butter knife, you know, quite slightly wide to get it in and turn the barrel to get in the fucking thing. But I, I can empathise with, with all of the things you said, like it's had no power steering, impossible to steer, and it had like plumes of blue smoke used to come out the back where we drove. It's fantastic. <laughs> a real piece, a re- genuine piece of shit. It re- really was. But funnily enough, it never broke down. Ever, but it just just kept chuntering away. So British Leyland, I think, is much maligned. They weren't all rotten, but they, they weren't big on design. Put it that way. I'm really sorry if we've not asked all questions, but we're going to finish as always with Samuel the cat, who's oh, got he's his brilliant. Spot. It's like, brilliant. He, he's turned into the bastards Parkinson. He, he's um, good. <laughs> he's phenomenal. Every week is a gem. He's got his slot. He's booked it. He says the year's twenty twenty seven. Yeah. Betting online is overdue to bookies wanting open banking and anti-gambling head the ball campaigners. So all of you have to return to work, sadly. Oh. <laughs> what sort of real-life crappy job would you choose and what special skills will you display on your CV to give to employers? John. I would take a leaf out of the book of Martin Blank, star of Gross Point Blank, 
Yes. And then become a government spook and start <laughs> killing yeah. people for money. And, and uh, I've got, funnily enough, as in gross point blank, I've got a school reunion coming up next month. And it would be a lot less shameful to say I'm a contracted killer than a professional gambler. So yeah. I might say that anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, what's your angle? Oh, I, I think the future is online romance scams. That's what you want to be a sort of a, 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 a US Army colonel that, that's, you know, that's stranded in some African country that needs 10 grand to bribe local officials to get, get a plane out there so that we can be together, my love, in. Checks notes, Hemel Hempstead. So yeah, online romance scams. I reckon I'm going to set up fucking loads of those and fleece all these silly old cows because I've got no morals now. This is the fall of Rome, honestly. <laughs> yeah. this is it. Did you read the story about the chap built up? Got way well, he's got done, but he got two hundred and twenty five grand in his bank account from online romance scams. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 you know, you, you think it's extraordinary that there is actually quite a rather nice book which I think I mentioned before right, somewhere on Amazon where. There was a guy, quite, quite a retired guy, Scottish guy, um, a nice house. I think his wife passed away, just spending these remaining years playing bowls. And he used to connect with friends on Facebook. And he had a message straight away from Oksana from the Ukraine, for instance, saying, I, I'm liking your picture very much. Can we make love or something like that? And he thought, aye, aye, this, this doesn't sound right, he said. And eventually he charted over a 12-month period his interactions with this woman, allegedly a woman, that was trying to part him from, from from his cash. And it's quite a brilliant example of how he managed to scam the scammer. And whatever this person wanted money for, he was able to devise a fake solution. So, for example, was, oh, my goodness me, I've terrible, terrible things happened. I've got to go to fucking northern Russia. My grandmother has had a heart attack. And she needs 15 grand because, you know, to pay for a heart operation. Please, can you send the money, Mr. Bob? And he wrote back and he said things like, oh, that's very fortuitous, Oksana. My best friend is a heart surgeon and he's doing a lecture tour in that part of Russia this week. He was very happy to <laughs> pop along to see your grand and he'll do the operation gratis. You can see these people on the other end going, oh, fuck, 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 you know. And whatever it was, like, you know, is your, your joke, the motorcycles crash, no problems. My friend owns a Honda dealership three miles from your house. He'll happily sort you out of the free Honda if you just give him the details. And eventually, at the end of the book, the woman, or well, the, the scammers, whoever they were, wrote back and said, you're a horrible old bastard. We hope you get cancer. And that was it. Because he never parted with a bean from them. But, but really good book if you can find it on Amazon. Good stuff. Great story, that, mate. <laughs> right. <laughs> Mine would be simply to join the grift. It's an easy one, this for me. If you like, remember that old John Smith advert? If you can't beat them, join them. Oh yeah, shit. Yeah. But this is it. Um, so yeah, I would literally become a complete anti-gambling sort of grifter. <laughs> they would love you. Say, They'd love you because you, you know that everyone yeah. loves a redemption story. That you would make super money because it's like in the in America, like we get these far right characters that were you know last month I was a neo Nazi, but now I've turned my life around. They throw money at them because everybody loves a redemption story. So I reckon you're onto something there. And I talked to the Lord and I've seen the light. I've exactly. seen the light. <laughs> Bring the light. Amen. <laughs> Testify. Praise the Lord, brother. Yeah. Pay up, bitch. Other, other right. accents are available. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, yes. I hope you've enjoyed the shirt like we have. It's a rousing finish to a miserable shirt. Yes. And that's what we're all about. A bit of mm. fun and a bit, a bit of shit. You love it. I hope you enjoyed it. That's all from me, John and Chris. Bye for now.